Hi there my friends, welcome or welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today's video is a little bit different. I've already completed the background on this piece and throughout this video I'm going to be showing you how I worked on the actual subject which is, which is a European barn owl. Getting my words mixed up already. So to create the background um, I taped a piece of Clairefontaine pastel matte paper to a board using acid free framers tape. I then applied soft pastels in the form of pan pastels to create this out of focus background. Popped a little few highlights here and there. Then after I'd finished creating the background I did the tree stump and that was all created using pastel pencils and then the filmed portion for today's video is just the owl itself and I created the whole owl just using pastel pencils two different brands Creta Colour and Faber Castell this time so I actually masked off the portion of the owl and the tree stump while I created the background then when I removed the masking film it left the owl and stump clear and very clean. Um, I didn't need to mask off the owl again when I did the tree stump because I was just using pastel pencils, finish the tree stump and then onto the owl. So that's the sort of process I used to get this far. If you want to view um, how I create backgrounds in pastels, there's plenty of videos on my YouTube channel showing how I go about creating backgrounds. So I didn't want to include it in this video because I knew this was going to be a long one anyway. The video is running at about just over an hour, I believe. Okay, so I wanted to start with the eye. For me, the most important part of a portrait uh, of an animal or a bird or even a human, anything, is the eye. People tend to focus in on the eye when they look at the eye and for me it's the most important part of the painting to get right. Proportion wise, all of my sketches were done on a separate piece of paper then once I was happy with the proportions of the sketch I then transferred those lines to this piece of paper so that I'd already got quite a firm foundation to work from. So I've just gone in with a few darks. There's not a lot to be seen in this owl's eye because it being quite small and it's slightly in shadow as well. <coughs> Difference being with owl's eyes is they, wherever they want to look, they point their heads. So their eyes are sort of fixed in position. It's not as though the owl would be um, its head would be pointing in one way and its eyes would be looking in a different direction that would look incorrect because anatomically it is so wherever the head points the eyes point the same way so just getting that in there I don't know why but I felt like I needed to so yes getting the darks into the eyes with a few highlights of blue a little bit of a creamy white in the eye and tiny little bit of reflective brown and left it at that for the eye. Now I'm starting building the darks into the, I went to say foliage then, plumage surrounding the eye and just working slowly dark to light at the minute. Just when you're looking at reference images and I worked from a few um, for this to get this pose how I liked, it's not just one reference photo, I use quite a few. And when I'm looking at a reference image to apply colour, I look beyond the detail. So I'm trying to visualise what's actually underneath the layers at the top that you can actually see. We're seeing lots of browns um, and blues, but I wanted in to introduce a lot of purples into this piece that weren't actually in any of the reference photos. And I'm really pleased with the outcome so that's good you can see the finished painting to the top left hand corner so yeah so I hope everyone's keeping really well uh, been a busy uh, few weeks this end but uh, not complaining at all okay so we're going on with some lightish grey there I picked it up I tried it, it realized it wasn't the color that I wanted and I'm reaching for another color so many people ask me ab about listing colors and things like that colors not that important I'm looking to get contrast in, in my paintings um, and if I pick up a pencil 
or a paint, you know, a mixture of paint, if I'm using acrylics or watercolours or gouache or oils. If I'm not happy with that colour, I'll just put it down, either mix another one or pick another colour up and try that. So for me to list the amount of colours that go into a particular painting, the list would be huge, to be honest, because I pick things up, try them, don't like them, put them down, pick, pick another one up. Or if I'm mixing colours, obviously if I mix two colours together, there's, then there's not a name for that colour anyway. And with pastels, I am blending colours together. So again, you know, I'm picking up a, a yellow at one point, a blue at another point. They're mixing together. They're going to create a green. There is no name for that green that I've just created. So just keep that in mind. When you're creating your artworks, a lot of it is you're, you're teaching yourself all the time and... I can understand beginners wanting to know what colours to use, but when it boils down to it, it's not that important. It, you know, it's not that important. If you see lilac or blue in a painting, pick up a lilac, pick up a blue, try them. If they're not right, put them down and pick up another one. That's simple as that. Okay, so I'm building up a lot of um, underlayers now. So I'll go around the whole area of the face, um, building up. A little bit of contour because there's obviously a lot going on underneath those layers of feathers and I want to get that feeling of depth and the only way to get that feeling of depth is by layering and luckily thankfully with uh, pastels you can work dark to light and light to dark now for those of you that haven't heard of the paper before it's Claire Fontaine pastel matte paper and it has the texture of cork so it doesn't actually feel rough or anything like that but it holds an immense amount of layers when working with a light hand which I am here. Uh, there are lots of other pastel papers on the market and I have tried quite a lot of them but this is the paper that I always go back to. This is the paper that I always recommend as well. You can get it in a variety of different colours but I just stick to quite neutral tones. This grey, um, a light blue, and there's a very light beige colour. I believe it's called sand. And they're the ones that I'll stick with. You can get black paper, white paper, uh, or different colours actually. But they, they're the ones I'd stay away from. I'd always go with neutral tones. So building up some blues. And sort of earth tones and lilacs. And when you see the finer detailed layers going on top of this you'll understand why I put those colours in first so just fast forwarded a little bit um, just to give you an idea so already that face is taking shape and because the surrounding area surrounding the eye is now a little bit darker it gives you that little bit of depth as well so it looks like the eye is actually in the face and not just floating around on top of the face and I do go backwards and forwards uh, quite a bit with the beak because uh, the photos that I was working from didn't show an awful lot of detail of the beak. Uh, one of the photos, the owl was a lot fluffier <laughs> than the one I end up with. So a lot of the fluff, fluffy feathers were covering the beak. But you'll see as I build it up. So yellows, I actually go over that yellow and take it down quite a bit and use flesh tones instead. But the th if you do, if you are creating a painting or drawing and you put a colour in, maybe you pick up a wrong colour and you put it in where you don't want it, that's fine. If it's a medium that, where you can layer, then just layer over it. Um, if it's a medium that you can't layer over, say you've put a really bright red in somewhere in a landscape in watercolour and you can't lift it back out, just put that that colour somewhere else in your painting and by putting it in more than one mm. area it will bring the painting together and make it look like that colour was deliberate. So as you can see the, um, the beak is building up slowly. That's um, a blending stump and I use those with graphite, charcoal, pastels, anything, any dry mediums. I keep a, a few 
for each medium. I don't interchange between mediums with them. And when they start getting a bit grubby on the end, I just wipe them off on a tissue and then I can carry on. So I've known of people to try sharpening these blending stumps in a pencil sharpener and that's not a good idea because they end up fraying and then they won't have that soft um, flexible end that you really need for blending uh, dry mediums. You can blend things with your fingers but obviously then you run the risk of skin oils entering the paper and things like that and that's not great for longevity it can alter the pH of the paper. The Clairefontaine pastel matte paper is acid free and the piece of glassine that I'm resting my hand on is also acid free. That just stops any work underneath my hand from smudging. So now all the base coat is in as much as I wanted it to be and now I can start building up the more detailed layers. And you can go backwards and forwards with this. If you start building up your detailed layers in a pastel piece and you find you're not liking the results you're getting, you can blend them down. You could blend them down with your finger or you could blend them down with a blending stump or a soft sponge, dry sponge, and then start again. As long as your, t the, your paper has plenty of tooth, you can build you know, a lot of layers up, go backwards and forwards until you get the result you want. When you saw my finger going over the paper then, I wasn't blending those layers, I was just patting them and it just pushes them into the tooth of the paper. As I said, this paper has got a lot of tooth, it can take many layers um, and it doesn't require a fixative at the end, which is great because fixatives, I don't know if you're aware, but most fixatives tend to dull very light and bright colours. Some people like to spray fixatives in between layers and that's okay because then you can be putting your lighter and brighter layers on top of a fixed area. But when working as I do with Clairefontaine pastel matte paper, I never feel the need to use fixatives. So a lot of people have been asking for another long video, so that's why this one's made its way onto my easel and now onto my YouTube channel. So slowly building up the layers and interchanging different colours as well. So I'm not just using white. I don't you, when you're using white or black in a painting, less is less is more. So I'm using a very light pink, a very light yellow and a light lilac to build up this area. And I can go backwards and forwards and then I can glaze colours over the top of these layers if I find these layers going too light. It's a slow process but it's so enjoyable. I hope everybody's keeping well and keeping creative. So fast forward in a little bit there and you can see how the layers have been built up. And I've zoomed in a little bit because the sunlight coming through the front window of the studio was catching the bottom of the drawing board a little bit. Fine for me working. I did end up pulling the blind down, blocking out the sun. What a shame. But it would have been very distracting had that been left in the video. As you can see, I've also darkened the beak quite a bit from the last clip as well. Now, having left um, a masking film on the owl while I was doing the background, you, you can end up with quite a harsh line running around the, the subject itself, which is great, great when I was running down the back of the owl because I wanted it nice and bright. But when you're working with feathers and fur, it's nice just to soften that edge as I'm doing here. And there's a couple of reasons that I didn't actually use soft pastels when working on the owl. And it's quite, I know quite a few people, one of the reasons is quite a few people, oh, please like and subscribe. That's a self reminder for me to mention it. <laughs> That's just popped up on screen. If you haven't already, uh, hit like and subscribe to the channel. That'd be great. Yeah, a lot of artists, um, beginners and sort of intermediate artists have mentioned that they haven't got 
soft pastels at all. They've been uh, gifted or they've purchased pastel pencils. So I thought it'd be really nice to do a subject like this where I'm just using pastel pencils and you can do a lot with, a, with just a few. As long as you're buying a good quality pastel pencil, you can really mix colours and create a lot of depth and detail if that's what you like. So there's, I know there's a whole range of well-known brands out there of pastel pencils. And for me, I've probably got more than enough. Um, I do get gifted a lot of materials from different art material manufacturers. And I'm an ambassador for Derwent. So I have Derwent's full set, um, Faber-Castell full set, Crete Colour full set, um... De La Rowney full set. Yeah, I think that's, that's, there might be some oddities as well, but I can't remember them off the top of my head. But with pastel pencils, you actually only need a few because they are blendable. You can mix the colors. Um, even if you have a piece of paper to one side, you can mix colors together and then apply them with a clean blending stump. So you know you don't need to go out and buy a full set if you have a full set then that's great but if you've only got a limited amount try mixing your own colors blending colors on the paper going over one another um, until they blend that's another good idea just play with your materials and don't be frightened of using them and I know some people say oh, but I don't want to waste them well they're being wasted if they're just sitting on a shelf doing nothing you know you bought them or somebody bought them for you or you know somebody gifted them to you what a shame if you're not using them just get some paper get your materials out and just have a play okay so the top of the head and running down the back of the head was created just the same as the face just applying light layers slowly building up those light layers and blending them together just to create the feeling of soft feathers round the back. <coughs> Excuse me. I always end up coughing when I do voiceovers. <laughs> Sorry. So building up some uh, very light yellows, lemony yellow and sort of a burnt sienna colour. Now you can tell that I don't know my pencil colours. I just reach for whatever I want and use it and if it doesn't work I put it back and pick up something else. Blending stump again and if I'm blending a large area where there are lights and darks what I'll do first is I'll go in and blend the lighter areas and then blend the darker areas and then wipe the blending, bush, br the blending stump off on a tissue. And again, a little bit more blend in there. And that's the light lilac, the Creta colour pencil. It's really pretty. Um, going back to different sets and different makes of pastel pencils, you will find that they come in different hardnesses. Hardnesses, is that a real word? Yeah. Okay, so the so probably the softest pastel pencil set I have are by Karen Dash followed by Derwent and then the hardest ones I have are probably the Faber-Castell Pit Pastel Pencils. Um, the Creta Colour are hard but not quite as hard as the Faber-Castell and within a range of pencils the softness and hardness varies between colours. So it's nice, all of the ones I have Karen Dash were the ones that I missed out originally when I, I let you know which ones I had but um, all of them are available open stock which means you don't have to buy a set you can buy single colours and give them a try and obviously if you've got a set and you're running low on one colour you can just go online or go to your favourite art shop and buy that single colour without having to purchase a whole new set, which is a bonus. The uh, blending stumps, you can purchase those um, 
on places like Amazon and art shops and they're relatively cheap just a few pounds and you get them in packs of five or eight or bigger sets of ten but they they really are very very affordable and they will last you a long long time but I do suggest keeping ones that you use for graphite and charcoal separate to the ones that you use for dry mediums such as pastel now when working in layers as I'm doing on this owl if I run a darker colour over a lighter pigment or a lighter colour over a darker pigment it will pick up some of that other colour it's especially noticeable when I run a light colour over a darker colour and you don't want your pencil to then transfer that pigment elsewhere so in one hand I've got the pencil but in the other hand I've got a tissue and when I'm going between areas that are quite different or overlapping areas that are quite different I will be wiping off periodically the dust that's built upon the pencil from the other pigment and it just stops that um, cross transfer of pigments where you don't want it so as you can see using this nice bright purple <laughs> As I said, the uh, reference images that I was working from, none of them had any purple in them at all. So it's just I wanted to add lilacs and purples. I just thought it was nice uh, running alongside the yellows and oranges that I introduced to the bird's plumage. And as I said, colour is not that important because if this owl was sitting under a blue light or... A red light then the plumage would look very different indeed the background um, was there was no uh, there were no reference images for that that's just something that I wanted to to do in this piece and the tree stump was out of my head as well so <laughs> don't look too closely <laughs> although I, I do have quite a few reference images that I can look at if I need to to get a rough idea what wood looks like on an old tree stump but most of this was from my imagination so just going round creating a little bit of shadow under there now back in with the blending stump again now just because the light is hitting a subject from one side doesn't mean that the other side of the subject is going to be you know totally contrasted from the light side so you're not going to have white on one side and black on the other side because you know feathers like fur like any object really is reflective it's going to reflect some of the light and some of the color that's surrounding it and you also get things like bounced light and things like that and that's just something to keep in mind when you're diverging slightly from a reference image um, just give it a go even if it's if you start working on something it doesn't look right then might maybe try and find a reference image of something where there is the lighting that you want to achieve or the shadows that you want to achieve or the color of a shadow that you want to achieve and nine times out of ten scrolling through um, websites such as unsplash.com and pixabay.com generally you can come across items that do have uh, shadows that are more blue or purple or a cast shadow maybe of green or something like that whatever you're looking for generally you're going to be able to find it in other reference images and also if I was working on this subject um, and looking for maybe a cast shadow of purple if I just type in purple shadow into one of those two websites I'm likely to come across maybe a boat or a shoe with a cast shadow it doesn't have to be the subject that you're looking for it just gives you some ideas of how to create shadows or highlights even in the using the colors that you're you've got on your palette oh feel like I'm slow slowing down on my words obviously not drank enough coffee today okay just have a quick quick drink now so going in with that peachy color 
and just looking at um, some of my reference images and a couple of my sketches and deciding where I want these feathers to to lie how long that I want them how far apart they're going to be spaced and things like that because they're they're lines that I didn't transfer over from the initial sketch so some people like to transfer lots and lots and lots of detail onto their prepared surface whereas some artists transfer very few I guess I'm somewhere in the middle I'll transfer the ones that I feel I need to keep a composition together and to keep proportions correct but apart from that I'll freehand the rest in but that's completely up to the individual this is why um, I've nothing against tracing if it gets people painting and drawing then that's great but you do need to or I do advise people and students to practice freehanding as well because there will become that you know there will come a part in a painting where maybe you've missed a line out and you need to freehand in or you need to freehand in some detailing that was too small to be seen on a reference image things like that so practicing freehanding is always uh, a good thing always and it can be enjoyable especially in a sketchbook just get yourself an old sketchbook and practice some sketching and you would be surprised how quickly um, you get to know your subjects more the more you sketch and even if that's um, tracing um, a reference image a couple of times and then trying to freehand it by tracing it you you will have already traced the actual true proportions of a subject and then when you go to sketch it for the first time and freehand it for the first time you will already know what the proportion should like having already traced it so that's an idea if you're a bit wary about freehanding for the first time yeah, you could yeah just trace something in a couple of times and then have a go at sketching it or like me if you've been sketching since you were a child then it, it's probably going to come quite naturally to you anyway so that was short and sweet on that part of the wing and now building before I finish that wing I need to get the tail in because obviously the wings are overlapping the tail so you can't see much of the tail feathers through there but you know they're there you know the wings are sitting on top and so uh, that's why I'm getting the tail feathers in next I like to work from the back of a painting to the front of a painting so that things are sitting on top of each other and that way you you end up not having a halo around things I do watch some artists who um, like to put the background in last um, but I do feel that a lot of the time they end up with sort of a halo where the background is meeting the, su the subject and I'd rather do it the other way around where the subject slightly overlaps the background. If there are any subjects or mediums you'd like me to um, film the process of, <laughs> that was a long drawn out sentence, uh, just pop a comment in the comments below I do reply to everybody's comments and my to-do list is growing so if you've got any ideas of what you'd like to see me do um, yeah just drop it in the comments below that'd be great and yes please like and subscribe if you haven't already just hitting the like button helps the algorithm along and obviously subscribing is great too thank you for those that already have truly appreciated A little bit of lemon yellow, a little bit of light lilac and a peachy colour going in just building up some texture. And the good old blending stump again just to soften the edges. Don't want the viewer's eye to be drawn to the, to the tail so uh, softening everything as I go. I'd love to know what you're all working on at the moment um, if you've tried pastels before and have you enjoyed them 
Or what mediums do you like to work in? What subjects do you like to create? Okay, so just put in a guide in there, just a tiny bit, just so we can see where the actual mid vein of the feather is, the quill. I uh, have a lot of people ask about how long a painting takes. And to be honest, when I first started doing commissions, Oh, way back, way back, long time ago, when I was sort of 14, I started commission work and I'm 58 this year, so long time ago. But I used to time um, my pieces. I used to make a note of what time I started a piece and when I finished that session and then the next day, you know, what time I'd start and finish so I could build up... Um, a detailed list of how long a piece actually took to complete so I could price it properly. These days I don't because generally I'm working on more than one piece at a time in the studio and I flip between paintings and drawings so I don't time anything. All I can say really is that a piece in the studio like this sort of size, which is it's a decent size, um, will be on and off the easel for maybe two months. Sometimes less, sometimes more. Depends what I'm working on. And obviously different mediums, they take different amounts of time as well. So there's really no way of me um, even guessing how long these take now. Except for video footage, I guess, but then I don't film every single bit and I have to edit out sharpening pencils, getting up, getting a coffee, <laughs> drinking coffee while I'm working, things like that. So putting a little bit of shadowing down that side and bringing a little bit more colour over just to give a slight curvature to those tail feathers and blending it all in again. And sometimes I'll blend things back and then not like the results so I build the texture back up again and then maybe only blend back a tiny bit. Also if I get to a point where I feel like I'm filling the tooth of the paper too much I'll get a piece of scotch tape, lay it gently on the surface of the paper, rub it with my finger and then lift the excess pastel dust off. When I say dust it's pigment I don't get very much fall off um, when I'm working on Clairefontaine pastel matte paper at all. The easel stays quite clean. The paper is very grippy. So I wasn't blending with my finger then, I was just patting the surface and it just pats the pigment down into the tooth of the paper. Put in a little bit of shadow in as well. Referring back to my initial sketch and some of the references. And the references were mostly off unsplash.com. I was going to use my own references but I'm having problems with the external hard drive at the minute so um, couldn't get onto them for this one. little bit of highlighting going on there and I do flip from one part of the painting to another <coughs> excuse me which isn't shown in this video because I've edited it out or they can see the sun creeping up the left hand side of the board but I do go up and uh, pull the blind down but yeah I do flit around um, I'll be working especially as the painting takes shape I'll be working on maybe the part of the head and the tail and maybe part of the body and I'll flip between the three areas as the painting is building up and that's just to keep a balance generally it's a balance of texture balance of color balance of contrast they're the three main things that I'm watching for as I'm building up a painting because you don't want 
if there was no um, contrast in the head and lots of contrast in the tail area then the viewer's eye would be drawn straight to the tail and not the head so it's just nice to keep a balance going throughout the painting even with um, colour vibrancy if the colours on the head were really really vibrant but not on the tail then all of the focus would be on the head and really you want the viewer's eye to travel round a painting and then rest on a certain spot and generally with uh, paintings such as this uh, a study of a particular subject the viewers I tend to travel around a little bit and then steady themselves on the face of the bird they normally start with the face and finish with the face whereas in landscapes and things like that it's quite different how you work a composition because you want to lead the viewer's eye into a painting and then travel around the painting but also have somewhere to rest in the painting as well. A lot of artists use a diagonal pathway that leads the viewer's eye into a painting and things like that. So referring back to my initial sketch again, sometimes I sketch on paper, mostly I do sketch on paper, sometimes I'll do a digital sketch and just have my iPad propped up to one side so I can keep looking at a digital sketch. Uh, reference images, I never, very, very, well, very rarely, I can't remember the last time, ever print them out. I just bring my reference images up on my iPad screen and work from there. I can't see the point in wasting paper or wasting ink on printing something off that's going to end up being put in the recycling bin. So not good for my pocket and definitely not good for the environment. So that's why I work from reference images on my iPad. And my iPad is normally to the left of my board and my art materials are normally on the right of me. And I am working, this whole painting was worked at an easel in an upright position. When I'm applying the um, base coat layers, generally speaking, I do make sure that I am going in the direction, I'm putting the pencil strokes in the direction that the more detailed layers will go as well. So that if any of the underlying base coat layers show through, they, their fluidity, they're going to be running within the correct direction of the finished parts of the painting. So building up those darks quite randomly because I want it to look textured. So there'll be no physical texture, but there will be visible texture. I've just moved the glassine over a little bit for my hand to rest on. And this uh, glassine is by Claire Fontaine. I think it's called Claire Fontaine Crystal Paper. But you, there, there are many brands of glassine that you can buy and um, just check that they're acid free before purchasing them and they're brilliant because they just they don't pick up anything they don't pick up the pastel from the paper i've worked on top of charcoal and graphite and they don't even pick up the paper doesn't even pick up that and then when i store finish paintings and drawings i always make sure i've got a sheet of glassine paper between them and if people order commissions uh, things like that i pack them with glassine around them as well just to protect the uh, painted or drawn surface and it just ensures nothing's going to get smudged or damaged. Back in with the blending stump just softening everything down now and 
Here I'm checking that I've got the lights and the darks in the right area. I can always increase the contrast because obviously the dark areas aren't that dark at the moment. I can always take those a little bit darker if I need to. <coughs> but I don't use white at this point because when you use white, you can't get any lighter than white. So it's nice to leave your lights, uh, sorry, your whites t till last. So just going in with a cream colour there. Well, lemony cream, lemon, I don't even think that's a real colour, lemony cream, but you can see what I'm using. That looks pink, but it's actually a coral colour, that one, it's lovely. And just strengthening those darks and tapping the pigment in. Because sometimes the blending stump will blend things a little bit too much and generally that's when I tap the surface so just tapping the pastel down into the tooth of the paper and it doesn't tend to blend with the other colours then if you do it that way and I do make sure I haven't got any lotions on my hands before I start um, my art day wash my hands before going to the studio just to make sure there's no um, hand cream or anything like that on my hands but generally I'm using the glassine for the majority of the time and if I don't have glassine at hand I'll use a mole stick to rest my hand on while I'm painting and drawing You know, those little details um, it doesn't look like there's much going on then when I was using that yellow colour but when you're up close working on this you can see the texture it's creating and working up layer by layer is much better than going in with a heavy layer and then realising you've applied too much it's better to work with a light hand and less is more. You can always add more, but it's harder to uh, take away. Because the worst thing now would be for me to put too much pastel on and then have to get the scotch tape out to start lifting it back off. You can remove some with a putty rubber. You have to be careful some putty rubbers, um, especially the cheaper ones, do contain oils and that's the last thing you want on your paper. Um, is it any any kind of oil so if you're going to buy putty rubbers make sure they're by um, a well-known brand and if in doubt just check reviews um, if you're buying it from online that generally speaking art material manufacturers will have reviews up of their products or if you're really in doubt then just contact the art materials manufacturer and ask them is your paper acid free is your masking tape acid free is your framers tape acid free are your kneadable rubbers acid free or oil free and things like that and if it's a well-known um, company that cares about their art products they will reply to you or they should reply to you I've learnt the hard way. I used a blue tack to apply some pricing labels to frames, not realising that blue tack has a sort of an oily content to it and it stained one of my wooden frames. So no, you need the white tack, not the blue tack. Nobody had told me and I didn't know. So, um, yeah. <laughs> learning the hard way but it's a lesson learned I won't make that mistake again okay so we're on to these lovely flight feathers now these primaries um, or are they secondaries they're secondaries so um, just building up the layers again rinse and repeat making sure I've got all of the uh, dividing lines feather dividing lines in they can be softened as I go if they're standing out too far 
but at this point I don't want to um, be working colours where I shouldn't be working colours or have too many feathers or not enough so I do go over the um, dividing lines of the feathers a few times just to make sure they're in place and then soften the effect where needed as I work the colours into the paper. Obviously working on a grey tone paper some of the lighter colours are going to be a little bit translucent and uh, pastels aren't as opaque as we like to believe they are and the grey of the paper can show through slightly if like me you go on with light layers to begin with obviously the more layers you apply the more opaque the medium becomes all I'm concentrating on now though is just getting the divisions on the feathers where the markings are going to go where the lighter areas are going to go and when where the darker browner areas are going to go and this is where artists talk about the ugly stage um, it's just part of the process it's very natural it can be off-putting to beginners and believe me, I'm still doing paintings now after how many years? Long, long time. And every single painting or drawing goes through an ugly layer. And you just have to trust the process, trust the techniques and um, trust your abilities just to overcome that ugly layer. Just ignore it and work through it. And don't be frightened of making mistakes because making mistakes is a way of learning too. And we all we all pick up the wrong colour from time to time <coughs> or put the wrong colour in the wrong place or the right colour in the wrong place. We've all done that. And art is a process of learning. So you'll just learn not to do something again, hopefully. I think the more you the more you do, the um the more relaxed you become as well. And the more mistakes you make in your art journey, the easier it gets to deal with mistakes. So a mistake you made five years ago might all of a sudden out of the blue crop up again. But because you made that same mistake five years ago, um, just means you know how to rectify it now. Just building up the layers slowly but surely. And as I said, I'm just adding in colours that don't exist in the reference material, but in my imagination, that's how I wanted them. And uh, I'm really happy with the results. So definitely something that um, I recommend is if you're unsure about what colours you'd like to see in a painting just do a little thumbnail sketch that's a little sketch just a couple of inches square um, and just try some colours out together see what look nice together if you haven't got a colour wheel at hand then you can look at them online plenty of websites showing colour wheels and it shows you which colours look nice together, um, which colours complement each other. They're normally the colours that are opposite each other on a colour wheel. So blue and orange, for instance, red and green, opposites on a colour wheel, complementary colours. So when they're placed side by side in a painting or drawing, they make each other zing <laughs> and they make each other pop. And there's lots more... Um, you can do with a colour wheel uh, but colour theory is never really anything that I've been wanting to study or anything like that I just like to figure it out as I go along and a lot of it comes with practice you know which colours are going to work well together which colours mix well and yeah just part of the process So no blending yet, just overlaying these colours and then I'll go through with a blending stump and blend them together. And as you can see, as I said earlier, all the pencil strokes are going in the direction 
of the feathers. <coughs> Excuse me. Just darkening areas slightly. Don't want these feathers to look flat because each of the feathers has got a slight arc to it, slight curve, and I want that to be seen in the finished painting. And now you can see why I darkened the dividing lines a little bit because I didn't want to lose them as I was building up the layers. Now softening that pinkish area down want to leave some of it showing through but uh, going over with a light blue just so randomizing the textured area around there We have about 10 minutes left on this video. Thank you for everybody that's uh, sticking with it to the end. <coughs> and a little bit of bounced light along that edge. So using just a little bit of a blue along there for a little bit of bounced reflective light. Now this Crete colour pastel pencil is a very dark purple. It's quite a subdued purple, very nice for shadows. Add in a little bit of visual texture there, a little bit of shadowing, darkening those feathers slightly. And just building them up one feather at a time now. So I generally do um, one type of technique on one feather and then move on to the next and do it on that one and then the next do it on that one then back to the beginning like painting the Golden Gate Bridge <laughs> back to the beginning for the next round of details and then working through the feathers like that because if I make a mistake with colour on one feather I will put that colour elsewhere as I said earlier in the video so it looks as though it's deliberate and not a mistake. And don't be fooled by time-lapse videos, it's something I was talking to a friend about time lapse videos make especially on YouTube makes it look like these paintings drawings or you know sketchbooks and things just take a matter of minutes and people then think they can go and do the same thing in an evening or an afternoon and without a reality check that these things take a lot longer um, than the time lapse video that you actually see and it, I think it can be, I think the more you've done artwork in the past, the more you appreciate the time that goes into something. And I think it can be beginners that get unstuck a little bit or they can become a little bit, um, I don't know what the word is, a little bit not confused, but disheartened, I guess, that they're not achieving the speed of which they're seeing thing. I mean, obviously looking at this, you know this is sped up, but for a beginner, maybe they might think that, you know, this is not far off real time footage, but in actual fact, a lot of this is sped up uh, 500 speed. So um, you're looking at sort of five times as fast as it, it actually was. So, yeah, it can be a bit disheartening for, for people when they realise things can take a lot longer than expected. So this part, this portion of the owl is done from start to finish. So I could really show you how the texture in the feathers and the different type of feather are built up. 
So first of all, I'm looking at my initial sketch and reference images and I'm mapping out where I want the fluffy feather ends to be that are showing up sort of purple on the left hand side of the bird. So that's the first thing I do. I'm looking where to map these areas out. It doesn't have to be exact. It can't be exact really because it's from different um, images and my sketch. So I'm just roughing out, making sure that I've got placements um, that I'm not going to lose. Now I'm just tightening up those little feather parts just so I don't lose them. Making sure they're all going to stay in place and I can see them from a distance. Put in a little, and you'll see why I'm doing it this way in a minute. Tightening everything up a little bit more. In with the blue. So where I've gone in with that pink, I'm now going in with the blue, but not all over. Just very, very random. So some of the pink will show through, some of the blue will show through. Added texture, nice and quick. Now where I want the brown parts of the feathers to be, I'm going in with this cream, like a lemony creamy colour. And starting to map out now that where my browns will go and where my lilacs will go. And then blending out towards the edge of the bird there. Adding a little blue to that area. Now where the lemony yellow is, going in with this rusty colour. And now you can see that part of the bird's fo uh, plumage, I won't say foliage again, <laughs> starting to take shape. Going a little bit darker where I want areas to be shadowed. More pigment in some places, less pigment in others. A little bit darker, a little bit of glazing went over the purple area <coughs> to glaze a shadow there. Just darkening and all that will blend together but it's very random and in with a blending stump. Going around all of the browner areas first before going on to the lighter blue and pink areas. So quickly wipe off the darker pigment and then go on to the lighter pigment. Blending it all into the paper, not pushing too hard, just, just a, um, a gentle hand just to push it in. Now this is a very, very dark purple. And all I'm doing is random squiggles to begin with because this is the texture that I'm going to be working on top of. So I'm not completely covering up all the blue and pink that I've um, initially put on. I want some of that to show through, but I also want this random texture pattern to show through as well. And this takes time. This looks really quick actually watching it back now, but it, it took a while. <laughs> I think I was listening to a podcast on the day I was working on this area. So gradually working all of that texture in. There you go. So that's all the texture in. Now adding some of the darks and you'll see the feathers start to come to life now hopefully. So working dark to light. So now I'm putting in the finer feather texture. I hope you're glad you've made it this far to see this bit coming to life because uh, I really do like this part of the painting. And I like this part of the video too. So just building up some nice warmth in the feathers now. and working dark to light. 
and none of this was in my reference images so this is all sort of <laughs> sort of being made upon the go I had sketched a little bit into my um, initial sketch that I did on a separate piece of paper just to give me a rough idea but it is a, a rough sketch just getting ideas down on paper before going on to this painting drawing yeah painting pastel painting I think most people call pastel artworks pastel paintings So just building up the texture, building up, building up some fluffy edges to some of the feathers as well, because the owl is looking a little, a little bit fluffed, not a lot, but a little bit. And letting some of those marks spill over onto the purple areas. Obviously the purple areas haven't got any highlights on yet. And off camera, um, towards the end of finishing this painting, I do actually go down the right hand side purple feathers right at the very edge and I just glaze them over with a bit of a dark blue. But that's when all the filming equipment was finally switched off for the day. So lots of texture, little feathery details, keeping an eye that I don't get carried away and make him, make him look hairy or anything like that. Just where the light is catching edges of the feather, feather details. And with quite a limited palette as well. Always best to just keep your palette quite limited and then your colours all play nicely together. If you start using too many colours it can look quite artificial. Add in some white details now to the purple parts of the feathers and that's random too. And some of them end up getting blended down in the shaded areas and I leave some of them to stand out in other areas where reflected light would be hitting them as well. Underneath the chin and bottom of the neck I do go in there later and put some more detailing into those softer feathers. But it's just the same effect as how I'm working this part of the wing. And back. <coughs> and all I was concerned about with here, this is a white um, pastel pencil now, is just keeping a fine tip. And I do rotate the pencil round in my hand just to maintain the fine tip for as long as I can before sharpening on a piece of sandpaper. And there you have him, finished painting. Thank you so much everybody. If you've made it this far, your ongoing support, encouraging comments and kind words are truly appreciated. If you haven't already, please hit like and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to see more artistic content in the future. And I'll leave it at that for now and I wish you all well and I'll see you all soon. Goodbye for now. Bye bye.